Moving on to today's program. Before I introduce you to our next guest speaker, I want to put before you a number of questions that I'd like you to ponder over. My dear brothers and sisters in humanity, have you ever wondered why so many young British and European women are increasingly turning towards Islam? Have you ever wondered why young Western women are happy to depart from that drinking and partying lifestyle and turning towards the direction of Islam? Have you ever wondered why famous modeling girls prefer the hijab over the exposure of their bodies? Have you ever wondered why some famous journalists and TV presenters preferred to leave their life of glitz and glamour over a faith presented by the media as a harsh and violent religion? Is it because these people are no longer modern? Is it because they have been influenced by an extremist friend or a colleague? Or is it because they want to marry a Muslim partner who they have fallen in love with? Well, my dear brothers, today we have the honor of listening to the reason, to the rationale of why one of MTV's, MTV Europe's most famous journalist and presenter, Sister Christiane Bakker, decided at the height of her career to ditch her glamorous showbiz lifestyle and turn away from the red carpets and champagne to embrace a completely different faith as her new faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have Christian amidst us today. Hamburg-born Christian Bakker had been nominated as the global ambassador for the Exploring of Islam Foundation and was the face of the inspired by Muhammad campaign in UK. She has also authored the very famous book, MTV to Mecca, which takes a read on a spiritual journey across the globe. And I'm hoping that these books will be on sale at the back of the hall and Christian will be available to sign your personal copies. And I hope she's got enough of them because there's 1,900 people here today. I just want to end what Imran Khan had to say about her. He said, I'm glad, beginning the quote, he said, I'm glad I had the chance to introduce Christian to the culture and religion of Islam. I admire the sincerity with which she continued to discover the faith for herself and her steadfastness in practicing it. This book, MTV to Mecca, will inspire Muslims and non-Muslims alike. May Allah bless her and give her all the success. Ameen. May I invite Sister Christiane now to come forward to the podium and take us through her journey, her exciting and spiritual journey of faith, Sister Christiane. Thank you very much for this um, extremely generous introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you all? Are you looking forward to a packed evening full of enlightening speakers, inshallah? The pressure is on a little bit on me now after this amazing introduction. And thank you so much. We, we brought a lot of books. Um, thanks to Zubair, he ordered a lot of books. They're all um, in the back room. And inshallah, I'll see some of you there later on. Um, and we can have any personal questions or anything like that because uh, we were supposed to do question and answer but I think we have too many speakers so I will have to do that a little bit later. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We start in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most kind. Um, if someone had told me at the height of my career that one day I would be standing in Blackburn in front of an audience full of pious practicing Muslim, as a practicing Muslim myself, telling everybody how I came to Islam, I would, have must, I would have told them they must be absolutely mad because I was living a life quite far away from a life of faith, uh, any faith you could say. But God works in mysterious ways and he knows what he's doing. 
As my introduction to Islam, he um, uh, was sent someone special, which we, who we will get to in a minute. But it is really quite extraordinary how God guided me from a life of hedonism and materialism to really inner fulfillment and contentment, which I didn't find in the entertainment industry. Now, before I reverted, 15 years ago, when was it, in 95, even a bit more than that now, um, I had pretty much everything a young person can dream of. You know, a dream job, interviewing rock stars, um, going to all the VIP parties, uh, red car the red carpet being rolled out when our little camera team arrived in, in anywhere in Europe, because, uh, you know, MTV was very popular. And um, I interviewed the Rolling Stones, uh, Lenny Kravitz, uh, Robbie Williams, uh, hang out with Elizabeth Hurley, and went on the road with Prince. Probably most of you don't remember any of these characters, but they used to be very famous 20 years ago. Um, but um, so one time I stood in front of 70,000 people, 70,000 young people. It was at the Rock am Ring Festival in Germany where Prince was about to perform, so everybody was looking forward to seeing Prince, and then I was shoved on stage to explain the Prince competition. I didn't even have time to get nervous, and you know, the sea of people, and everybody screaming and clapping and everything else, and it felt like floating on a cloud of energy, you know? I can, uh, can I, from that moment on, I, I could really understand what it must be like for rock stars when they play and they get this energy back. It's a real sort of symbi symbiotic exchange and it's co probably quite addictive. But then, back home in the hotel room, I was alone. It was the noise still ringing in my ear. And it was always this rush and then, you know, being alone again and nobody there, nothing. And, you know, how do you come down? So people take drugs, people take, drink alcohol whatever they do. Um, all I knew is that I felt there, was the moments, there were moments in my life, although I had it all, where I felt lonely and empty inside. In fact, I, I felt this inner void really from being a teenager, I remember, in Germany. Something was always missing, I felt. And I couldn't really put my finger on what it is. I thought perhaps a partner or a cause to march, to, go to fight for, you know, on the streets like the students used to do in the 60s. In my time, the 80s, 90s, everybody you know, was fairly content, so there wasn't such, such, um, you know, such causes and so on. So um, something was missing. I thought perhaps also a soulmate, but in retrospect, I realized that no human being really could fill that void, only the divine. And the divine was not part of my life at all. Eventually, I experienced a deep crisis. I was rushing from one show to the next all over Europe, always stressed out, having to be perfect, having to perform. And I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing, and I didn't know where it would all be leading to. I was then sent to host another show in Belgium, and I remember in the airplane, I thought, if this plane crashes, it also doesn't matter. I really couldn't care less. And then I, I wrote in my diary um, something like, I feel so ill, much worse than I've felt in a long time. Sick, dizzy, weak, no energy or drive irritable and jaded. When is this low going to come to an end? It's work, 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 and then I'm alone again. I don't want to work just for myself anymore, and I can't stand the pressure any longer. Tonight I'm supposed to entertain 2,000 Belgian farmers. Can't they think of anything worse? Just, uh, you know, where is this all going to lead to? Anyway, um, so it, it was really at this time of dissatisfaction of course, once we were in Belgium and once all the audience was there, we made the most of it and did stage diving, this, that and the other, but you know, it was just, I wasn't really there with my heart and soul. And it was at this time of dissatisfaction that uh, I was introduced to Islam. Not by a long-bearded imam, no offense, gentlemen, but uh, by a handsome sports star, the former cricketer, now politician Imran Khan. He had just won the World Cup for Pakistan, something which had completely passed me by, because being from Germany, um, I had no idea about cricket, never followed it. And he also didn't follow music, so he didn't know that I was on, an, on TV and a VJ and so on. Anyway, he challenged me with his ethical and moral values and asked me, what's the purpose of life, in your opinion? And I couldn't answer that question, never thought of it didn't have time to think about it, rushing from one show to the next. You know, it, it sort of made me think a little bit. Anyway, the first time I then joined him and some friends to go out for dinner, 
I turned up in a mini dress and um, he asked me if I could keep on my coat all night. And uh, it was a little bit of an unusual request, but he explained there were some Pakistanis coming and Indian people. And actually in his culture, women don't show flesh. Men and women dress modestly. And um, so, you know, in the entertainment business, of course, the motto was, if you've got it, flaunt it. And here I was now beginning to learn about the concept of modesty. And, you know, on reflection, it made sense. Why should a woman advertise with her body, half naked, any kind of product on, on advertisements, you know, from car tires to cigarettes and alcohol, um, you know, uh, that is quite degrading, actually, if you think about it, and undignified. Um, whereas even now in business meetings, I, I'm surprised when men always wear suits and women are scantily dressed. It's, it's really, why do women need to sell themselves like this? I find it sad. But anyway, also I, I, at that time I remember there were certain actresses who made it their deliberate strategy to dress to impress or, you know, less, wear less to impress, really, to get the front cover of a newspaper in order, you know, to get to advance their career, really. And I criticized one of them and um, she didn't like that very much. But uh, anyway, you know, I began slowly, it made sense, this idea, and I slowly began to change my own um, sense of dress and started wearing longer clothes on MTV. And... Um, uh, you know, never mind, nobody really noticed initially the fashion was grunge then uh, at the time, but when that fashion went, I still stuck to my longer clothes and felt more dignified and, you know, um, happier. Men not whistling at me in the street because I show my legs and stuff like that. It's just, it's just a, it's a better feeling. But what touched me most uh, was, you know, it's a better feeling to be appreciated for your personality, for your actions, for what you think and for what you say rather than for your body. That's anyway, I fully believe that now. But what touched me most at the time was that Imran wanted to give up his cricketing career to become a charity worker and uh, build a hospital in Lahore where the poor people would be treated for free. And, uh, and he managed to do that with an army of volunteers from around the world who all gave their time and effort and energy for this higher cause outside of themselves for God in the end of the day. Uh, believe in God and uh, do good deeds, uh, Imran said, was part of, was the essence of being a Muslim. And that sounded quite nice. He played Sufi music to me by Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan. Anybody know Nusrat in this audience? A few people, oh, that's good. Um, a marvelous uh, Kawali singer who sings about uh, love, uh, love for the beloved that turns into love for the ultimate beloved, love for God. And... Um, you know, and or sings about great religious figures, as you know, you probably know most of the songs yourselves. And it really, so I learned about this higher love uh, through Sufi music. And um, it's, you know, those lyrics when they were translated touched me deeper than any pop song on MTV. They were heartbreakingly beautiful and really opened my heart for the culture and religion of Islam. So sometimes when people ask me, how did you come to Islam? Through music, I'd like to say. So. I mean, just because some people don't believe in music. But, you know, there is music that opens the hearts and souls. And, and that's something that I experienced. And Steve Winwood actually sings about um, this kind of higher love as well. He says, think about it. There must be higher love, down in the heart or hidden in the stars above. Without it, life is wasted time. Look inside your heart. I'll look inside mine. Bring me higher love. Where is that higher love I keep thinking of? I was determined to find that higher love. And actually, later on, one, there, were, there came a moment in time when I ended up praying with Steve Winwood and his family together um, in a church. He's a very uh, religious person. So Imran talked to me, but that was much later. Um, Imran, and I'm writing about it in my book too. Uh, Imran began talking to me about spirituality, about uh, the fact that there is another dimension to life beyond the material, what we can see and touch. Um, you know, and the, actually the unseen was something that had always fascinated me. I was a journalist before in Germany, and I did a lot of reports on the unseen, on, um, you know, on witchcraft, on the occult amongst children. I had this fascination. I was always on the phone to the Institute of Paranormal Studies, you know, investigating and interviewing the priests, this and the other. But um, it was all very unfocused. There was just a fascination 
for this, but I didn't know how to access it. So when the Nimran, you know, explained to me that the, we all have a soul and the soul needs nourishment like the body. Until then, I hadn't really noticed that I had a soul. And probably part of this, or the effect of this neglect was the fact that I, I was unhappy. And um, even though I had it all, you could say. And in those times, uh, the only remedy for when I felt low was retail therapy, going shopping. But of course, the pleasure you get from buying a new bag or a new dress is only temporary. Um, it doesn't last. So I began reading books on Islam. Um, our discussions made me think. And they were something of a wake-up call. You know, and what I began to read, the doctrines of Islam, once, once you look behind the headlines, actually made sense. I was captivated in, intellectually, fascinated. The idea that there's one God as our creator and the destiny of everything in the universe, absolute and all-powerful, infinitely good, compassionate, and ever-forgiving. A God who is greater than anything we can imagine, yet within each and every one of us, closer to us than our own jugular vein, as the Quran says. I seriously liked the notion of worshipping none but God. Not people, money, nor money, fame, status, fashion, or anything else. And that's quite a powerful notion. It's, it's really a liberation if you take it seriously. And also, I was astonished to find a lot of commonalities. You know, Islam wasn't something weird and something completely alien. Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, the, even the whole chapter on Mary, it, it was actually all quite familiar, yet more logical. Doctrines were, were more logical. You know, the fact there's one God, not the Trinity, which is hard to understand. Um, and I like the concept of self-responsibility, that we are responsible for our own actions. It's not someone else had already taken that responsibility away 2,000 years ago, but the way we live our life here has an effect on the eternal life, on the life to come. And there is divine justice in this life and in the next. So we must always take the big picture, um, have the big picture in mind, and um, you know, live uh, our life having that long-term vision. And also I could understand that babies are born pure, not with original sin. How can a baby be born as a sinner? How can you inherit a sin? Don't get it. So it made sense that, um, you know, that babies are born pure and we are responsible for our own actions. And also that, that God speaks the same message, has always spoken the same message, through different prophets at different times to different people. And it's uh, just one chain of um, revelation. And that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final prophet who confirmed what has come before, but tied up the loose ends, just completed the revelation. And so I, you know, I, I was just fascinated intellectually and I wanted to read more and more. And ever since then, I haven't stopped reading books on Islam. I still do. Of course, I was curious about the position of women in Islam and I had my own prejudices about it. And, you know, um, but, uh, you know, um, I was open-minded to, to seeing and checking it out. And in fact, a lot of the concepts, we can't go into it, also made sense that, you know, when you have children, it's the number one priority for a woman. My mother was there for me, number one, and didn't hand us over to staff, so I could relate to that as well. And soon Imran invited me to travel with him to Pakistan. And we trekked through awe-inspiring snow-capped mountains, spent time with simple people who made a greater impression on me with their warmth, their generosity, and above all, their faith in God than a lot of the people I'd met in the entertainment industry. For the first time in my life, I also discovered how much fun you can have without alcohol uh, in Pakistan, you know, where there wasn't generally any alcohol, and it was really a revelation. I couldn't even imagine going anywhere without drinking alcohol. Everybody does it. So it, that was, it was an interesting experience. And of course, subconsciously, I paid into attention how the women, how I was treated as a Western woman in Pakistan, and generally, it was always wonderful and with respect, and I liked being addressed as sister, and I felt safe. No one made any passes. As we climbed up higher the mountains, um, we came across very basic two-story houses where people lived in houses made of mud and wood above their animals. 
They had nothing. They had no satellite dishes, no running water, no heating. They lived above the animals so that the body heat travels up and works as a natural heating system. And yet, when we walked through their villages, they came outside of the houses, you know, with bismillah and uh, giving us in their bowls uh, walnuts and apricots, what, uh, the, wall, the uh, apricots they dried on their roofs, you know, and I was really, and the eyes were beaming, you know, and they didn't look depressed, they didn't look miserable, they weren't complaining, and I was stunned by, by the dignity in the face of dire poverty and the generosity, you know. Um, and it made me realize, you know, where did they get this from? Faith. Um, and uh, as soon as the jeep stopped, generally, it was always surrounded by a throng of people. People wanting uh, their cricket bat signed or wanted a, an autograph. But a lot of the times, people also pressed a few rupees into Imran's hands. This is for the hospital. You know, everybody wanted to be part of it. And just yesterday, I met one of his um, long-term associates, and he told me he also witnessed the same, how, how women took off their jewelry and gave it to him for the hospital, you know, uh, their, their wedding jewelry. And it's just, and Imran used to say, it's the poor people who build this hospital, not the rich. And it's this friendship and faith that really, really touched me. And it touches me now when I experience it, when people help me, promote the book, which is really a call to God, um, you know, purely because they believe in it for the sake of God and, and for no other agenda, you know. It's, this friendship and faith is, is something so special. That's one of the best things of being part of the Muslim community, really. Since my introduction to Islam, something grew in me, you know, uh, and, and Eastern culture in general, I must say. And uh, from the mountains of the uh, Khyber Pakhtunwa, we went to Lahore, where I was stunned by the exquisite beauty of the Bachai Mosque and other Mughal monuments, marveling at this, uh, you know, incredibly beautiful architecture. I, I thought, you know, again, something, I realized something great must be behind it. It's not only aesthetically pleasing, it's also deeply symbolic. Symbolic, I mean, all the geomet geometric pattern express some kind of heavenly realities. For example, the, the, you know, often it, there's the one in the center. The one God always points to the one. But uh, everything has a meaning, every pattern. And the arabesque, the floral designs, are a reminder of God's creation, God's, God's creation pure, you know, the nature. And um, so I was really, I loved the Mughal architecture. And in fact, I love all Islamic architecture. And it's so interesting how wherever we go in the Muslim world, it's um, different, in Morocco much more angular, but the principles that govern it are still the same. And uh, they all, it's all as a worship, built as a worship to God, and, and for us it's a reminder of God. And uh, for example, in comparison, when I go sightseeing in Germany, I go to some palaces or some great halls like this, you know, and I see in this, maybe in one of them I remember the God of chase, the God of plenty, the God of um, fertility and so on. And I think this is meant to be a Christian country. How come you have all these gods in your architecture? It doesn't make sense. But, you know, in Islam it's just 100% um, so beautiful and so meaningful and uh, with Allah, you know, as a worship for Allah and a reminder of Allah. So really my frequent travels through Pakistan affected me deeply and I really can say it's via Pakistan that I found my faith and I began to question everything in life the superficiality of the showbiz world I was part of the idea that sex sells the way women with their use their allure to get to places the obsession with youth in pursuit of eternal youth so many women and even some men in the entertainment business go under the knife have boob jobs liposuction or Botox injections but of course no surgeon toxin or technology can prevent the passage of time. But of course, I mean, only our soul is eternal. And so it makes sense to work on beautifying our soul, not our outer shell, which will go anyway, sooner or later. Fashion was another factor. Eastern women wear more loose-fitting outfits and seem to be much less under pressure to always be slim and diet. Instead, they draw their sense of security from their faith and their families. God does not judge you according to your bodies and appearances, but he looks into your hearts and observes your actions, said Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
This notion again resonated with me and made me realize that I'd spent years over preoccupied with my appearance due to the nature of my work as a TV presenter. So I wanted to make a conscious effort to be good rather than just to look good. I slowly began to change from within and these changes had an impact on the rest of my life too. I already told you I was started wearing longer clothes, etc. And I, and I, um, I talked about, and in fact, Nusrat's tour dates on MTV and some environmental issues on my German youth show and, you know, tried genuinely to bring some more substance into the programs. I also became aware of my inner voice, my conscience, that inner feeling which tells you when you do something right or wrong. And I, in fact, you know the Quranic verse, God gives us signs within ourselves and on the horizons, and it's, it's so true. I found studying Islam actually helped me cope with my day-to-day -day life, even then when I wasn't a Muslim yet. When I felt stressed out and under pressure, the Quran encouraged me, you can do it. With the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, God does not burden a human being with more than he can bear. And I learned that God rewards our efforts and judges our intentions. The outcome of whatever we are trying to achieve is up to him. So we do our best and leave the rest in the hands of God. This is a very um, calming you know, teaching. Because, I mean, other people without faith, they beat themselves up if things don't work out, you know, had I done this, had I done that. No, relax, you've done your best, the rest is in the hands of God. And, you know, we are being uh, rewarded anyway, whether it works out or not, for our effort and our intention. Alhamdulillah. The teachings are endless and, of course, still help me uh, on a daily basis. So after three years of research and my friendship with, with Imran was finished, I realized that Islam is not an academic exercise. If I wanted to feel, feel the religion and bring God into my life and wanted to taste the spiritual fruits, there was only one way get down on the prayer mat and start living according to the, to the rules and regulations. So really, I converted for spiritual reasons. I, I, you know, I wanted to, to pray to God. Um, and since becoming a Muslim, my prayers, the remembrance of God, dhikr, but also reading the Quran, reading books about the inner dimension of Islam, ennobling the soul, character training, metaphysics, etc., they give me peace and contentment and strength. The inner void that I always felt as a young person was now filled with meaning, with God, and with a desire to serve the good in whatever capacity. Just uh, last Friday, um, a week, Friday last week, I was in Slough for a book event and, you know, talked about the same sort of thing. And one guest afterwards came up to me and he said, you know what? Um, this uh, 11th century scholar, Ibn Hazm, I had already read a book by him, he said, and I really liked it, a book on love. This was a very dry jurist, and he wrote this most beautiful book on love. You must uh, try and check it out, Wings of the Dove. Um, so he also said something very wise. He said, some people drink to forget their void or soothe their pain. Other people womanize to do the same. But the only way we find real contentment in life is through knowledge of the deen. And it really struck me because it's true. And it happened to me and it's you know, true now, a thousand years later than when Ibn Hazm actually said this. And it just goes to show that the human condition doesn't really change. Now, of course, the process of transformation, one has to be honest, um, didn't happen overnight and it didn't come easy either. My first attempt at Ramadan was dismal. I had gone out the night before had a couple of glasses of champagne, and uh, the next day lay in bed with a pounding headache, deeply dehydrated, and um, you know, I could, now I wasn't allowed to drink or eat. And I gave it up. And uh, at that time, Ramadan was in winter, so it was a very bad beginning. Astaghfirullah, God, please forgive me for these bad beginnings. Um, uh, the next Ramadan, I had been giving up alcohol. And by that time, I had found a new tele, made a new television, had a new television program, and um, uh, basically, um, we it was Christmas over Christmas that Ramadan fell, and uh, in order to have a break, we needed to record twice the amount of programs. So from morning to late at night, I was speaking voiceover, speaking to the camera, and I thought, how am I going to do this without drinking in between? 
And I really was scared and I tried my very best, psych myself up and you know what, subhanAllah, I was able to. I didn't miss any drink, I was always moist, my, my mouth could speak, no problem, alhamdulillah. And with this experience I discovered one of the great secrets, uh, you know, this hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, basically that says, if you walk one step towards God, he comes ten steps towards you. But we have to walk the first step. We have to take that first step and then God eases the way. It's true, alhamdulillah, it's, it's amazing. And I now feel so empowered, not having to depend on any crutches, you know, not, not drinking anymore, not, not needing cigarettes or anything else, alhamdulillah. But I also um, uh, face a lot of difficulties when I embraced Islam. Um, and a lot of opposition uh, in the public, in the German public eye. I was literally hounded by the German press um, at the time when I converted. And I was an award-winning TV presenter, um, you know, very popular, had just positive press for seven years. And suddenly the headlines read, has she lost the plot? Will she be presenting a youth show from behind the niqab? Is she supporting terrorism? You know, and uh, it felt like I was suddenly public enemy number one and uh, it got from bad to worse. Um, and anyway, short, cut a long story short, pretty much overnight, I was sacked from my youth show, although I had a freshly signed contract and they had begged me to continue for another year. And I'd said, I've done it now for a few years, let me just do half a year. But uh, suddenly the contract was null and void and, um, and it was a, quite a big trauma really. And also MTV didn't renew the contract after seven years, but that was fine because I really had done every program there. And it, also, of course, I wouldn't have wanted to continue for much longer anyway because it, you know, pop music just wasn't the right thing anymore. But it was still a bit traumatic how it all happened. And I realized how little people actually knew about Islam, our beautiful religion. You know, and you must remember this was in 95, before 9-11 and 7-7, uh, you know, huge amount of Islamophobia and hostility towards Muslims, even then, um, especially in Europe. And of course, as a communicator, as a journalist, I wanted to speak out. I wanted to do something. I wanted to show the world about the beautiful values of, of our wonderful religion that I discovered, that Islam is completely different to how it is depicted in the media. But my agents in Germany said to me, if you ever want to work again in Germany, keep quiet about Islam. You know, and uh, they scared me. Many different ones told me the same. And actually, um, a, a spiritual teacher, a little bit later, told me the same. All the effort you have into bettering the world, into doing something on TV, put it first into bettering yourself, better your deen. And I'm actually very, very happy that I waited so long for this book to come out because now I'm on safer ground because I did then study for, for all these years intensely and uh, met so many scholars and, you know, really deepened my knowledge and also my practice. So alhamdulillah, now a journalist can't, you know, um, uh, you know I'm, I'm on safer ground, can't attack me so easily anymore. I'd like to quote um, uh, the imam from the other day um, from the Tawhidul evening who was standing here as well, and he said, um, he quoted Rumi, he said, when I was young, I was clever, and I wanted to change the world. Now that I'm older, I've become a bit wiser and began to change myself. And it's really so true. So we really got to always start with ourselves. So at these difficult, during these difficult times, it was my friends and faith, and of course my faith that pulled me through. You know, they made me realize the events happen with the permission of God. And there must be something good in it, you know, everything comes from God, everything happens with the permission from God, and God is good, he wants our good. Um, and also there's, there's good in suffering, there's good in facing challenges and difficulties, you know. I learned, um, for example, Rumi again, um, who likens uh, uh, suffering with cooking chickpeas in boiling water until they're soft, tender, and sweet. You know, and this is exactly what happens with our soul. It's being cooked, it's being purified and strengthened. You know, there's another beautiful um, quote from Alama Iqbal. Oh, hawks, don't be afraid of the winds. They're just there to make you fly higher. So bring them on, you know, or this, this other hadith, if God loves someone, he afflicts them, you know. So it's, it's, it's meant to be good for us. And I love this, other, this hadith as well. How wonderful is the situation of the believer? For all his affairs are good, 
If something good happens to him, he gives thanks for it, and that is good for him. If something bad happens to him, he bears it with patience, and that is good for him. This does not apply to anyone but the believer. So perceived in this way, the whole life is a win-win situation. Of course, the essence of every spiritual path is to annihilate the ego, to surrender our self, our whole being, sincerely to the will of God. And of course, Islam means surrender to the will of God, and it also means peace. Basically, if we surrender our will to the will of God, we attain to inner peace, and it's true. It's what I've experienced, alhamdulillah, and I'm sure all of us. Of course, walking this spiritual path entails patience, requires sacrifices, and a great deal of intellectual engagement. None of us, you in the audience, a lot of you are born Muslims, you don't inherit faith. You have to actively choose faith and look into it, not take everything for, for granted or, you know, for, for rule that perhaps someone else tells you. You need to look into it yourself and, and choose it actively yourself. And me as a new Muslim, I had to question so everything, so many things. And, um, you know, and, and so it, it really requires active uh, choice and, and a lot of work. And of course, commitment, time and effort to, to change, you know, uh, to make unpopular choices, giving up dating, giving up alcohol. I often had to fight almost for my, for my right to drink water. Oh, Allah isn't looking tonight, come on. Don't be boring. Oh, Allah is here too. You know, can't avoid, he's everywhere. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's no point. But uh, anyway, you know, also I needed to let go of a lot of things, some superficial acquaintances, a lot of clutter in my life, you know, uh, going to social events or whatever, just to make room for God, make room for contemplation, for reading and for new friends in faith. Change is never easy, but God does reward, and his mercy is always near. And he gives us so many gifts if we're only open to appreciate them. After nine years of presenting on national, on international TV, actually, uh, you know, MTV Europe and NBC Europe, I realized I could not continue hosting pop programs or promoting pop culture anymore because so much of it conflicted with my newfound Islamic value system. So I basically immersed myself into the studies of Islam and also natural health. And, um, you know, as part of the spiritual path, I learned we consciously, of course, we try to come closer to God. We try to refine our character, better our reactions, even our thoughts and our inner intentions. And we shed unhealthy habits. All this is the inner jihad, the inner striving on the way of God, uh, towards the light, towards God. And we naturally, of course, also we want to fulfill our potential, our God-given potential, you know. This is our fitra, our primordial makeup, how God has made us. How can we best serve God with the skills he has given us? This is something I needed to find out, you know, as an ex-MTV presenter. How can I work for God? How can I do something for God? Anyway, so, um, you know, it's basically listening to your heart, listening to your inner guide, you know, and then hopefully we'll find out God will guide us if we're truthful and, um, and, you know, and listen, trying to listen to this inner voice to find out why we are here on earth, what is going to be our contribution here, on, here to this earth, you know, what is the purpose of our life, how can we best serve God and serve humanity. So obviously pop culture wasn't going to be it um, and I realized, you know, if I want to be authentic, I need to promote something that I believe in. So now, inshallah, I'm trying with my book to promote Islamic values. And, um, you know, and I've now also sort of um, developed a new cultural TV program that deals with Muslim culture and lifestyle. I hope I can place it. But, um, you know, it gives me a lot of satisfaction to try and promote Islamic values, especially in the West, inshallah. Uh, it'll be it's a small contribution, inshallah. But, um, you know, I like it when my Arabic friends, when they tell me, um, my heart tells me, um, you know, my heart tells me. My mother always used to say, listen to your inner voice. And that inner voice and that heart, of course, it's God's guidance, you know, which will guide us to our destiny, our soul purpose, which is our soul purpose, the only reason why we're here. So we need to listen to our hearts and not, um, nearly finished, <laughs> and not uh, just do something to please somebody else. You know, because our reason for being here on this earth, 
there is a particular reason for it. So we need to light our inner fire, find our mission in life, our passion. And when we do what we believe in, we don't mind working hard, we don't mind putting in the extra hours because we're satisfied, we're doing it for our goal. And you know, that's what I'm trying to do with this book. That's why I joined the is Inspired by Mohammed campaign, again to engage with the media, to show, to try and dissolve some of those prejudices against Islam. And um, anyway, let's set ourselves high goals, try to excel in whatever we do, and reach for the stars. God is infinitely good. He just needs to say, he's generous. He just needs to say, kun, be, and it is, inshallah. So let's try and do well whatever we do. And remember, whatever we do, wherever we are, we are an ambassador of Islam. Our neighbors, our colleagues at work, judge us by our actions, by how we do. So let's be better than everybody else because we're Muslim and show. Muslims are, you know, brilliant and asset to society. Brilliant people and an asset to society. Anyway, I'd like to just end now with um, uh, a poem by Bullah Shah uh, from the Punjab in the 18th century. Most of you will probably know it, but anyway, uh, it sort of expresses my spiritual quest at the time. You read so many books to know it all, yet fail to ever read your heart at all. You rush to holy shrines to play a part. Would you dare enter the shrine of your heart? You are quick to attack the evil one, yet pride is a battle you have not won. You grab for a star you can control, yet fail to grasp the light in your soul. May we all find ways to grasp the light in our souls. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.